Section 14 of Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jordan Hazelrig. Journal of the Reverend Francis Asbury, Volume 1, Section 14. Thursday, the 29th. My soul is happy in the love of God. He gives me grace to die daily to the world and all the desires of the flesh. Dr. S. delivered a good discourse from Isaiah 26, 20, and 21 on the solemn occasion of a fast and preparation for the Lord's Supper. I spoke at night from John 1, 12, and 13. Monday, January 2nd, 1775. I see the great necessity of always beginning to glorify God with fresh vigor of soul. So prone is man to grow languid in devout exercises that without fresh and powerful exertions he will soon sink into dead formality. At Mr. B.'s, where we dine today, I was much grieved at the manner of Mr. R.'s conversation. But let it be a caution to me to be prudent and watchful. The next day my soul was greatly alive to God. And the people here are so kind to me that it fills me with astonishment and gratitude. Thursday, the 5th. For several days my throat has been much disordered, but it is now something better. Glory to God! He sweetly draws my heart into close and comfortable communion with himself. In reading the history of the Puritans, I am surprised at the conduct of Archbishop Laud, a monster of a man indeed. Friday, the 6th. Find myself free, through grace, from all impure affections. But I am troubled on account of my disposition to trifle in conversation. Yet it is the will of God to save me from this also. May the happy hour speedily arrive when I shall be altogether such as my Lord would have me to be. Saturday, the 7th. I had some conversation with that pious good woman, the widow of G.T. She greatly lamented the condition of her son, who was in the Jersey College, a youth of about seventeen years of age, but under no deep impressions for the salvation of his soul. How grievous must this be to a pious parent! While carnal parents regard only the worldly prosperity of their children, truly religious parents are chiefly concerned about the eternal salvation of their souls. I was informed today that poor A.W. is living with his wife and appears to be industriously inclined. Lord's Day, the 8th. The Lord was pleased to bless my soul with that peace which passes understanding. A letter from my friend W.L. informed me that three of my friends were coming to conduct me, if possible, to Baltimore. But it is a doubt with me if I shall, with consent, be permitted to go. May the Lord give me wisdom, patience, and faith, that in all cases I may know how to act or suffer, according to His will and my duty. Thursday, the 12th. The conduct of Mr. Blank is such as calls for patience. He has reported that I was the cause of A.W.'s becoming a preacher, whereas when he was appointed it was by the conference. At the time when I wanted him to travel was a year before his appointment, when his heart was right with God. Moreover, at the last conference I was doubtful of him, and so expressed myself both by word and letter. Friday, the 13th. As my throat was worse, I stayed at home and took physic. Part of my time was spent in reading the history of the Puritans, and I found my affections pure, and fixed on their proper object. Though Satan did not fail to assault me with many temptations. Lord's Day, the 15th. 
I visited the Quaker meeting, but wondered to see so many sensible men sit to hear two or three old women talk. In the latter part of the day, I was much indisposed and kept at home. But the next morning I found myself something better, and earnestly longed for purity of heart and perfect resignation to all the will of God. Wednesday, the 18th. In the night my throat was bad, attended with a smart fever. My mind is variously exercised at different times, sometimes thinking that my affliction is judicial, other times thinking that natural causes produce natural effects. But, blessed Jesus, I must be still and know that Thou art God. From this time to Lord's Day, the 23rd, I had a putrid sore throat, and two persons set up with me every night, but I found relief from purges and a mixture of nitre and fever powder. Mr. Blank keeps driving away at the people, telling them how bad they are with the wonders which he has done and intends to do. It is surprising that the people are not out of patience with him. If they did not like his friends better than him, we should soon be welcome to take a final leave of them. From the 23rd of January till the 1st of February, my affliction was so severe that I was not able to write. There were several small ulcers on the inside of my throat, and the pain of the gatherings was so severe that for two weeks I could not rest of nights. My friends were very kind, and, expecting my death, they affectionately lamented over me. But on the 29th of January, I was happily relieved by the discharge of near a pint of white matter. For a while my mind was in great heaviness, but after some severe conflicts with the powers of darkness, I was calmly resigned to the will of a wise and gracious God. O oh Lord, how wonderful are thy works! It is my desire to know the cause of this affliction, that, if it is in my power, I may remove it. Is it that I may know more of myself and lie in the dust, or for my past unfaithfulness? But whatever may be the cause, I humbly hope that all the painful dispensations will work together for my good. In the course of this affliction, I found that when my spirit was broken and brought to submit with cheerfulness to the will of God, then the disorder abated, and I began to recover. Though Satan was very busy, and, like Job's impious wife, suggested to my mind that I should curse God and die. Nevertheless, through grace, I am more than a conqueror, and can give glory to God. The gargle which I used first to scatter, if possible, the inflammation was sage tea, honey, vinegar, and mustard. Then that which was used to accelerate the gathering was mallows with a fig cut in pieces. And lastly, to strengthen the part, we used a gargle of sage tea, alum, rose leaves, and loaf sugar. On Monday the 30th, some letters came from Baltimore, earnestly pressing me to go. And Mr. R. was so kind as to visit me, when all was sweetness and love. Wednesday. February 1st. I am once more able to write, and feel a solemn, grateful sense of God's goodness resting on my soul. My all of body, soul, and time are His due, and should be devoted, without the least reserve, to His service and glory. Oh, that He may give me grace sufficient! Thursday, the 2nd. I am still getting better but not able to speak in public, though the word of the Lord is like fire within me, and I am almost weary of forbearing. The next day my mind was much taken up with God, and several of my friends, who were so kind as to visit me, were melted in conversation and prayer. Saturday, the 4th. My mind was filled with pure evangelical peace. I had some conversation with Captain W., an Israelite indeed, and we both concluded that it was my duty to go to Baltimore. 
and I feel willing to go, if it is even to die there, but at present am not permitted. I was confined to the house all the next day, but oh, how painful are these dumb Sabbaths to me. However, it is my duty to submit to the providence of a wise God. Monday, the 6th. My body is but weak, and my mind is somewhat distressed, lest I should be too much concerned about the ark of the Lord, and wish to take the cause out of his hand. How frail a creature is man! How little can he penetrate into the design and works of God! Tuesday, the 7th. Mr. T. R. took me in a chaise to dine with Mr. R. N. and Mr. R. A., my mind is somewhat troubled with temptations, but still I have peace. I am weak in body, and want more patience and resignation to submit to the will of God, till he is pleased to restore me. What is life? Lord, help me to be always ready to end it here. Wednesday, the 8th. From the state of my body today, I feel great expectation of being restored to health. But, oh, how my soul longeth for more spiritual health. This day I wrote to Mr. R. at Baltimore to come for me. Thursday, the 9th. My body continues to recover, but I discover many weaknesses and failures in my inner man. When shall my soul be adorned as a bride for her bridegroom? When shall all within and all without be holiness to the Lord? Notwithstanding my illness, I have read Neal's history of the Puritans, consisting of four volumes, in about two months. Friday, the 10th. How great a blessing is health! Though of late it is but seldom enjoyed by me, but, through mercy, my body now feels like being restored and I am afraid of being thereby too much elated. The Lord shows me the excellency of affliction, and enables me to exercise resignation in all conditions of life. I am now reading Mosheim's ecclesiastical history, but as a writer he is too dry and speculative. Tuesday, the 14th. My heart pants to labor for God, to be once more employed in building up his spiritual house. Oh, that he may strengthen me, set me to work, and greatly bless my poor endeavors. Preaching the glorious gospel seems to be my proper employment, and when I am long detained from it, I appear to be out of my element. But hope, a blessed hope, revives, that before long I shall be of some service in the Church of Christ. Thursday, the 16th. My mind has been kept in great peace, but I am somewhat troubled on account of my defects in usefulness and spirituality. May the Lord make me more serious and more spiritual in all my internal and external actions. And though my mind was much taken up with God on Friday, yet I was too free in conversation. My earnest desire is to have full power over every thought, word, and action. I now ventured to preach from Psalm 126, 3. The Lord hath done great things for us, whereof we are glad. R.S. wrote me a letter with his usual kindness, and informed me that Mr. D. concurred in sentiment relative to my going to Baltimore. And it is thought by many that there will be an alteration in the affairs of our church government. Lord's Day, the 19th. Mr. R. preached his farewell sermon from Deuteronomy 30, 19. He has now been here ten months. Monday, the 20th. Most of this day was spent in private devotion and reading. I am full of humble expectation that the Lord will restore me to better health and greater usefulness. May my eye be single, aiming at nothing but the glory of God, that my whole body 
may be full of light. Wednesday, the 22nd. I received a letter from Miss G. at Antigua, in which she informed me that Mr. G. was going away, and as there are about three hundred members in society, she entreats me to go and labor amongst them. And as Mr. Wesley has given his consent, I feel inclined to go, and take one of the young men with me. But there is one obstacle in the way, the administration of the ordinances. It is possible to get the ordination of a presbytery, but this would be incompatible with Methodism, which would be an effectual bar in my way. It appears very strange that after so much affliction my heart should be so languid and dull. This day Mr. R. N. set off for New York. Thursday, the 23rd. Mr. R. F. and Mr. R. A. came to town. I preached in the evening from Romans 1, 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, etc., and showed, first, of what he was not ashamed, the experience, precepts, and blessings of the gospel, to preach it in his purity, to suffer for it. Secondly, why he was not ashamed of this, because it is the power of God to salvation from the guilt, power, and remains of sin. The power of God is displayed in preaching the simple truths of the gospel. Thirdly, to whom it became so, to them that believe, first, the threatenings, precepts, and invitations, and then in Jesus Christ for this present salvation. Saturday, the 25th. I packed up my clothes in order to depart on Monday morning for Baltimore, and while giving a few words of exhortation in the evening, we found it a solemn, feeling time. We also had a very powerful season the next evening, while I preached to a full house on the awful subject of the rich man and Lazarus. Monday, the 27th. My dear children in the Lord, P.R. and S.O., with several other kind friends, accompanied me out of town. We stopped at Chester, where I preached from these piercing words of our Lord, Thou knowest not the day of thy visitation. There are but little hopes of this place at present. Though if they do not fill up the measure of their iniquity, the time to favor them may come. The Lord hasten it before the present generation drops into eternity. As it is some time since I have been accustomed to labor and fatigue, my body was exceedingly weak and weary at night. Tuesday, the 28th. Stopping at Wilmington to preach in the evening, a barber came to shave me, who once professed religion, and had been a soldier in the 23rd Regiment. But now he is a deserter, both from God and man. On our way to Susquehanna on the next day, we accidentally called on Mr. I. H., whose heart was much affected while we prayed with him and his family. When we came to the ferry, we had an agreeable time, several joining us while we called on the Lord by prayer in our room. Thursday, March 2nd. We called at the house of Mr. J. D. and rested about an hour. Sister D. has treated me with all the tenderness of a mother towards a son, and may he that will not forget a cup of water given in his name abundantly reward her. We then pursued our journey to Baltimore, and my heart was greatly refreshed at the sight of my spiritual children and kind friends there, for whose welfare my soul had travailed both present and absent. The next day I had the pleasure of seeing our new house and my old friends, with some new ones added to their number. Here are all my own with increase. Lord's Day, the 5th. Both in town and at the point, large numbers attended to hear the word. The power of God was present, and I had an inward witness that it was the will of God I should, at that time, be amongst those people. In I is come home to God, and R. M. is on his way. Monday the sixth. 
My mind was peaceful and calm. The next day I set out in a carriage for Mr. T's, about nine miles from town, and found a large congregation, many of whom came from Elk Ridge. On Wednesday I returned to town and was powerfully assaulted by Satan, but glory to God, he is my son and my shield. He discovers to my mind the temptations and keeps me from their power. May I ever feel my obligations and delight in giving all my strength and time to his service. Thursday, the ninth. My spirit was grieved within me to see the wickedness of mankind in this town, to see how they oppose the truth of God, the power of Satan is only checked in a small degree, but when shall he be quite cast out? Before he will suffer his kingdom to be entirely overthrown, he will, no doubt, do all he can in stimulating his trusty servants to defend his cause. Preaching on Friday at W.L.'s, the wealthy Mr. C.R. was present, and who can tell but the Lord may reach his heart. Saturday, the 11th. My body is somewhat unwell, but my soul is in health and peace, though I have some cause of lamentation for being too free in conversation with my friends. Lord's Day, the Twelfth Much of the power of God was felt at the point, and a divine energy went forth amongst the people that night in town, while I discoursed from that awakening scripture, Romans 2, 8, 9, and 10, but unto them that are contentious, and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish, upon every soul of man that doeth evil, etc. Christ was precious to my soul, which was filled with divine peace. I saw Brother S. and entered into a free conversation with him. His sentiments relative to Mr. R. corresponded with mine. But all these matters I can silently commit to God, who overrules both in earth and heaven. Monday, the 13th. After preaching at O.C.'s about five miles from town, in a comfortable frame of mind, I returned. The next day I parted with Brother S. and felt my mind depressed by temptations. But a holy flame glowed in my heart, while discoursing at night on the cloud of witnesses. Believing that some souls were benefited, I commended myself to the divine protection and slept in peace. Though it rained on Thursday evening, yet many attended whilst I enforced the apostolic injunction, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. It is to be feared that many Christians do not lay aside every weight which impedes their spiritual progress. If they did, they would not halt and go on as if they were weary, but be enabled to run, and that with patience, the race that is set before them. Friday, the 17th. The glory of God and the salvation of men were my principal objects. I went to preach at the point, but they were training the militia so that the town seemed all in confusion. Saturday, the 18th. Peace and pure desires filled my soul, and Christ was the object of my love. Glory be to thee, O Lord. The next day the Spirit of the Lord God was with me in preaching at the point, and with great pathos I was enabled to deliver the truth at night in town. Many of the audience felt the weight of God's word. May they yield to the sacred touch and be saved. On Monday and Tuesday, I made a small excursion into the country and labored to bring souls to Christ at Mr. R.'s and Mr. T.'s. It seemed C.D. has not lost all the concern he felt some time ago. I afterward returned safe to town in the evening and spent a part of the next day in reading Taylor's treatise on holy living. This book was made a blessing to me above seven years ago. I preached in the evening from 1 Samuel 10, 6, The Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy with them.
and shalt be turned into another man. Here I took occasion to show, Roman numeral 1, the operations of the Spirit on the heart of man to convince, convict, convert, and sanctify. Roman numeral 2, the effects of these operations. Subpoint 1. A strong inclination to speak for God. This is the duty of every Christian. Subpoint 2. A great change in judgment, desire, spirit, temper, and practice. I found myself much indisposed when I returned to my lodgings, and the disorder of my body depressed my spirits. Friday, the 24th. I ventured to Patapsco Neck, and had a full house at Captain R.'s, whose wife is brought by grace to the knowledge of God in Christ Jesus. Lord's Day, the 26th. My heart was delightfully taken up with God. In the time of preaching at the point this morning, my spirit was tender, and many of the audience were much melted. I also found myself greatly drawn out in preaching at night in town. Tuesday, the 28th. Mr. O., the Dutch minister, accompanied me to I.O.'s, where we had a blessed and refreshing season. The next day, at town, I met with Brother W. from Virginia, who gave me a great account of the work of God in those parts, five or six hundred souls justified by faith, and five or six circuits formed, so that we now have fourteen circuits in America and about twenty-two preachers are required to supply them. Thus we see how divine providence makes way for the word of truth, and the Holy Spirit attends it. May it spread in power and cover these lands. Brother W. is a very singular man, but honest in his intentions, and sincerely engaged for the prosperity of the work. I dined with Mr. O., the minister mentioned above, and spent the afternoon with him and Mr. S., another minister of the same profession. They both appear to be sincerely religious, and intend to make proposals to the German Synod this year, to lay a plan for the reformation of the Dutch congregations. Friday, the 31st. This was a day of joy and great consolation to my soul. I clearly saw the propriety and necessity of devoting every faculty in every hour to God. Lord's Day, April 2nd. Many people attended to hear the word, and there appeared to be much feeling amongst them. I had a desire to hear from myself, Mr. Blank, the Presbyterian minister. His discourse was quite systematical and amusing, but if he had studied to pass by the consciences of his hearers, he could not have done it more effectually. Monday and Tuesday I spent comfortably in laboring on a short tour in the country, and was graciously assisted in Tuesday night at town. Wednesday, the 5th. I experienced the benefit of visiting the sick, and found much satisfaction in my own soul, while speaking plainly to a carnal young man. The next day Satan assaulted me with great violence, but he found my heart fixed on God. Friday, the 7th. After visiting two sick persons, I went to Brother L's and was enabled to speak freely and feelingly to a large number of rich and poor assembled there. On Saturday I returned and found that a young man who had turned his back on the gospel and devoted himself to sin had been suddenly snatched away by death. How awful! Does not this appear like the judicial hand of God? Does it not seem as a powerful warning to surviving sinners, especially such as answer his character? And yet it is to be feared many will not bear the rod, nor regard him that appointed it. Lord's Day, the Ninth Though my body was weak, and my mind grieved by the wickedness of the wicked, yet I was enabled to speak powerfully both at the point and town. The blessing of the Lord attended us, both at Mr. E.'s on Monday and at O.C.'s on Tuesday. Here I met with Brother S. 
and found we were of one heart and of one mind. Lord, grant that all the preachers may be thus united in sentiment and affection. Thursday, the 13th. Had some conversation with Mrs. J. from Philadelphia. She appeared to be in distress about her soul, and said she was convinced of her lost estate the last Lord's Day. Saturday, the 15th. God is my portion, and my all-sufficient good. He fills me with pure spiritual life. My heart is melted into holy love, and altogether devoted to my Lord. Many came to hear the word of life in the evening, and my soul was supplied with strength. End of section 14 Recording by Jordan Hazelrig